Hi guys, I, I cut my video feed, so save some bandwidth here. So so stick with the audio, but give me a second. Stop video, start sharing. So let's get uh, let's get cracking. So yeah. Topic for today is back to the office and back to the future and actually everything between them. So what is the office in the future? I don't know. Do we actually have offices or or data centers or so? But anyway, we need to cover the elements that we need to make that whatever is the future to, to be able to make it secure. So that's the topic for today. There's tons of stuff to cover. So so in a second, we, we start cracking. So yeah, as introduced, <laughs> my name is Marco Harala and I'm the security lead for Finland and Baltics at the Cisco. Uh, I was told that there's a moderator. If you guys have questions, feel free to put them to the chat screen and, and so on. So we, we, we cover them at, at least at the end of the, the presentation, but no worries. I'll, I'll, look, I'll try to look that in every now and then. So as I said, we have tons of stuff to cover today because the world changed pretty drastically as, as we speak. So so, but uh, let's do tiny recap about the old world because the old world was pretty simple. We had our DC, we had our office, we had our kind of logical place to work, and then we had laptop and and we have systems and we were if we were not at the office, we used VPN to to connect and then and we, we basically had tons of controls in place. So in the best case, we have this kind of onion type of defense here. So let me get my pen out here. So give me a second. So yeah, cool. So we had tons of control over the old world. So we had a DC, we had a place to work, we had a firewall, we had everything. We have a laptop, VPN, AV, everything, and we connected to our office and all was good to go. And if we really needed to go beyond, <laughs> meaning to the internet, we had this control in place. We had next in a firewall, taking care of the north-south controls. We had east-west controls. In the best case, we used the network analytics and uh, flow type of information information to get that visibility and control over the internal network, whatever happened in inside of our parameter here and, and so on. Of course, email and, and everything you can throw in this mix, we had them in place. So that was kind of the, the old world, but something really, really strange happened when we went to the new world. We still had our kind of a DC and, and, and place to work here that had those controls like thousand plus one, everything you had uh, had bought and and, uh, and and put in place. But then the new world, we went directly to the cloud. And what were our controls or where were our controls? In the best case, we had a password. And, and at the end point, the, the device that was directly connecting to the, the internet, there was basically only AV in place. So what happened with these two? So we had kind of a, the whole full stack here, the onion defense, layered defense in place here. And in a new world, uh, yes, we have a password and yes, uh, we have an AV. <laughs> in some cases, really, really had kind of a things like a network backup here that we took backups from the laptops and uh, make sure that the configuration was in place. But people didn't really go that way, so so they didn't open up the VPN every now and then. So did we actually got the backups, or did we have the configuration done? No. So this is kind of a massively interesting phenomena that happened during the COVID and and, and the new way of work that uh, we invested tons of controls and tons of money to build it in in, in by the book, and when when we went to the new world there was basically nothing in place. So really, really strange. But what happened to the threat landscape? <laughs> it, that's a pretty interesting topic also. So we had our kind of legacy DC here and, and all the controls and, and defense in place. But now when we are at the cloud, it's basically free access to your data center. Everybody can try to, to hack you from any place. It, it, it's out there. And, and you have those kind of new technologies. You have containers running to application buckets and APIs. And of course, the classical stuff, you have the phishing and, and, and the bad sites and all, all, all that's a multi-cloud, multi-everything and a free access to your DC. <laughs> and going back to one slide, what's your control? Best case, password. <laughs> oh my God. But also from the same time, from the endpoint point of view, that you have those vulnerabilities and, and you have the malware targeting your endpoint here. 
I call it as out of everything, because in many cases, as just mentioned, we build the whole structure in a way that this machine here needs to be connected to the, to the old world. So we can manage the configuration, we can apply patches, we can take backups, we can take this and that. But now we usually don't have this anymore, or it's, it, it's there every now and then. So can we kind of manage the system every now and then? It's kind of a bad policy for, for, for modern threat landscape. And of course, we have kind of the, the, the really, really bad stuff. We have somebody accidental doing something or malicious insider and, and so on. So where's the visibility and control? It's just simply it's not there because it's built on the wrong place. And this is something that some people don't get it still today, that I'm just buying a SaaS software. I'm buying something from the AVS. I'm buying something from the Microsoft. And I don't really need to take care of the visibility and control. Hmm. And then you end up in the evening news and, and explaining that something really went wrong. So, so there's this massively things changing as we go. But there's also a lot of good stuff here. And, and it's basically this, that the threat landscape evolved, the way of work evolved, new architectures evolved and, and came up. So we have kind of four things that we'll cover today more deeply. And all of these are the elements that you really need to basically secure your enterprise or, or whatever business today, regardless, are you living in a, in an old or new or hybrid or whatever type of world? Because these are the elements that you need to make whatever you're doing much more secure, much more visible, and put that control in place. So we have a couple of architectures here. We have the SASE, Secure Access Service Edge. Some people will tell you the story that you'll get the SASE architecture by putting the firewall in the cloud, and that's simply not the case. We'll cover that today. But anyway, there's a couple of uh, truths about that. So we need a couple of those controls, but the sec Secure Access Service Edge is an architecture, first of all. There's two elements in it, we'll cover them deeply today. And, and, and both of those are the ones that you'll need to secure the access to the internet today. The second topic, a second big architecture, which is actually a little bit more than a kind of a Gardner type of architecture is zero trust. You, you find zero trust from the NIST papers if you look at those. So we covered that also. Once again, zero trust is, as I usually call it, it's it's a framework, way of working, and and, and putting the new kind of uh, mindset in place. We we go through that. So so both of these architectures are are kind of interesting in many ways. And the first thing is that uh, if you look at the outcome, so you'll have your laptop here or system remote work users and, and modern workplace. If you take zero trust and, and SASE architectures. Is, is there actually a difference between them? If, if you start to talk about remote work, you authenticate users, you don't really trust them, you put them to the cloud secure way. So is it the SASE or, or zero trust? We talk about this also today, because there's a very little difference between these two hot buzzword type of architectures. If you really drill down the, the how they're built and, and what they're trying to achieve. Also a couple of new new technologies here. So to cloud NDR, network detection and response. We, we've been doing the network detection and response in the old network, up the, the legacy home network, the, the access layer and, and, and a campus and, and those type of places. But guess what? If you use cloud, especially if you use AVS or you start to put the containers and, and, and those in place, you'll have a huge cloud network. And by default, you have zero visibility in it, what is happening there. So that's a kind of a hot technology area today. How do we bring visibility and control to the cloud? And of course, we need something that glues everything together. So that's the, the, the SOAR and XDR technologies. We covered all of these. So these are the elements. And if you look at the elements from the product point of view and, and the Cisco point of view, we're going to talk about Cisco umbrella. We're going to talk about Duo. SecureX, that's the glue between everything, that's the unmanned SOC. And of course, we're going to talk about the product that was previously called StealthWatch, but now it's Secure Network Analytics. How do you use the network metadata to bring that visibility and control back? And everything here is built and, and thought and, and crafted in mindset that we 
basically lost the old school control for the endpoints. So people are not at our office. They are basically buying a whatever iPad using six euro SIM card and going towards the, the cloud and do the, the magic and, and the work out there. So how do we bring control back? So these are the elements and we start to drill down with this in, in a second. So let's start with the umbrella, secure access service edge. The way we define the, the SASE is pretty much equal and one-to-one and -one with the Gardner. So as I said before, some people will try to sell you the story that put the firewall in the cloud, buy a firewall, put it at the clouds, you'll get the SASE architecture. And that is not the case. Because the, the way that the, the SASE architecture is defined, you have basically two things. You'll have the network side of the things, and you'll have the network security side of the things. And it's an important picture in many ways because these two have relationship, but you can build this in, in so many ways. And if you look at the Cisco world, you can basically take the old school approach, whatever open source firewall and, 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 and build the connectivity between your sites. And you can take the security, the, the network security element here and combine it together. But either way, there's two worlds colliding here the network and also the network security. And that's something that's that's probably the first takeaway from this presentation that you need to understand that the SASE is so much more than just simply putting firewall to the to the cloud. Even that that's in, in many cases our competitor story, <laughs> but it's much more. So let's cover these elements inside of the SASE also. So yes, we have a couple of things here. We have the connectivity here. In many cases in our world, we talk about the Meraki or Viptela technology. So that's kind of the SD-WAN because the SD-WAN is, is heavily driving this, but it doesn't have to be an SD-WAN because as remember, let's call it a backwards. If you remember, there's a network as a service element here. So this connectivity here can actually be basically whatever but it makes tons of sense with the SD-WAN type of use cases, because if you have that flexible network, you want to have a flexible security on, on top of that. Another interesting thing here is because this is all kind of starting from the connectivity is that you'll have to have your access also included in the mix, because there's not much a point of view to building those tunnels if you don't have control towards your access network, basically the network that people are connecting in into your environment, whatever it is, or, or, or underlying technology stack that you have with your SD-WAN and, and so. So these two are, are linked together. They have to be linked together because otherwise you end up in a very weird scenario that you kind of have a SASE, but you don't have what we badly need here, which is the end-to-end -end assurance. So this is kind of a thing that people usually forget when they talk about SASE. They, they start to put the firewalls and tunnels to the cloud in place. And it's like a hybrid car. <laughs> if you take the hybrid car, you'll get the, the worst from the bold technologies. You'll get the bad kind of a battery lasting performance, and you'll get the huge amount of gasoline sucking engine that is that is trying to do its best with this hybrid world. So, so if you don't look at the big picture here from A to C, and, it, and you forget the service assurance point, and you forget the fact that this is actually an architecture, it ends up in a sideways. We, we've seen that so many times. So if you try to handle this with the simple kind of, yeah, let's build a tunnel to the cloud, you lose everything that you badly need, which is basically the end-to-end -end visibility. And of course, if you have the whole kind of a connectivity built here that you have, let's say the users here, they're going through access, they're going through the SD band, whatever connectivity they're going towards internet SaaS and a private public clouds, you desperately have to have that visibility that if something does not work, where is the problem? If 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 end users are complaining here that I have a problem with this performance with the AVS or whatever Microsoft or Microsoft 365. You have to have that single pane of glass place to see what's going on with the full stack. And same goes with the security. Once again, if you if you try to build this as some kind of isolated 
components and wrap around duct tape them together, it simply doesn't work. Because if you have a flexible layer underneath doing the connectivity, you must have flexible layer here, basically building the security elements in the mix. I'll cover Duo in a second because Duo is basically the zero trust and, and so on. But here's a very, very good example in this picture that if you take the SASE architecture, you'll do the connectivity from A to Z and, and put that assurance on, on, on top of it. And then you put an umbrella and Duo on, on top of that stack. Is this actually a zero trust or is it actually a SASE? <laughs> That's the interesting thing. So you can, of course, you can start to move more towards this kind of box here that we don't trust these endpoints. We don't trust the data. We don't trust the users. We don't trust anything. And magically enough, suddenly enough, the SASE actually becomes a zero trust story. So keep this in mind. These two architectures are very close to each other. But there's a couple of catches here. And the first catch was what I just explained, that you need to understand how these elements here are linking together so you don't lose the visibility from end to end. Because if you don't have visibility end to end, it's pointless to do the security because you simply cannot protect things that you don't see. And if you start to add security on top of something that you have no idea what it is, I'm pretty sure that the end users will complain and you end up in trouble. So yeah, a little bit more about the umbrella. So umbrella is actually a multifunction security solution that we have. The kind of the, the big story around umbrella is that yes, it is SASE. So you, you, you can build tunnels to the network. You can do DLB. You can do remote browser isolation, which is a hot topic today. So if you browse the network, you don't actually browse them with your browser you are isolated from that bad stuff. So if you end up in a bad place, that bad place cannot infect your systems here. But there's another story here also, which is the, the DNS layer here. So Umbrella, as, as it started from the open DNS acquisition way back in time, it was secure DNS server. So in many cases, we can achieve kind of sassy lookalike outcome in a much more easier way. And that's by using the DNS layer as a frontline defense. And it makes this compelling in many ways because in, in the SASE world here, the assumption is that we build tunnels. We build tunnels between our places. We build tunnels between the, the sites and the cloud. So that's kind of the assumption in, in a SASE architecture. But we can basically achieve the same outcome and in many cases, even better outcome by simply putting this kind of much more easier layers in place, which means DNS layer security. So in this case, I'm just using a Cisco DNS server here. I'm still building those tunnels between my sites going in a data center and so on, but I'm actually using the DNS layer to secure the endpoint and, and also bring the visibility and, and control in the mix. So here's kind of a basic secure remote work scenario from the architectural point of view. How does it actually work? So you have your remote workers. They are not at your site. Yet. They're somewhere using something. They have their VPN client. In, in our case, it's the, it, it's definitely be there. So, so be, because if you need to have that tunnel towards your classical DC and you'll have that kind of a application that is not still in, in a format of SaaS. So you have the any connect in place. But the benefit of, of using the umbrella and a SASE type of approach and architecture is that you can actually do the split tunnel here. And that is the big thing. It's, is it a split tunnel or local breakout? It slightly depends about the, the architecture here. But anyways, you, you simply have to have this because there's absolutely no point for you to put everything the internet traffic to the tunnel, to your classical DC, and then towards the internet. You'll get the worst of the both worlds. You So you lose kind of the flexibility. But we haven't been able to do this previously because if you did the split tunnel, you lost the control. But that's not the case with Umbrella. So if you use Umbrella, just nothing more than just a DNS layer security. You have the visibility, you have the control, you can do split tunnel, offload all the bad stuff here. Bad stuff meaning bandwidth sucking applications that are going directly to the cloud. You can offload them, put them to the cloud and not losing the, the control. And this is probably the first time in, in the history of security that when if you 
if you add security security in the mix it is actually better outcome for the end users you get a better experience because now the applications that need to go directly to the cloud are actually doing that but you won't be losing the control and visibility and same if they goes here remember you have the onion defense already in place so it just works perfectly so that's kind of the SASE in, in a nutshell. Of course, there's much more, but the key takeaways are that uh, it's actually two things. It's the network connectivity and it's the security controls. Both of them needs to be very flexible, regardless of whatever you have in the mix, it just to have to work. And the other takeaway is that if you take the SASE and, and, and really drill down what it is, you can have so much more benefit by, by applying it to the production, not just simply using the, the, the DNS, but you, you get the flexibility and visibility in place and you can offload the band sucking applications away. So that's key takeaway regarding the umbrella and, and the SASE. So element number one. So duo. Let's move move along. So the element number two, zero trust. What is zero trust? Of course, it's a buzzword. So everybody's talking about the zero trust, but the, what it is from the nuts and bolts, it's all about evaluating the trust towards different things continuously. And by default, we don't trust anything. We don't trust the user. We don't trust the device. We don't trust the data. We don't trust the network. We don't trust anything. But we still need to start building the trust from somewhere. And Duo is also a massively interesting element and zero trust because it's a second thing in, in security that by doing the things by the book, you'll get a better experience from the end user point of view. We covered that. So, so let's move along. Of course, Duo is, is mostly known from the, the MFA, multi-factor authentication. We, we basically don't trust the passwords. We, we need something else, else to, to authenticate. But that wasn't the reason why we bought the Duo back in the days, because Duo is so much more. And the first of those kind of uh, tiny things that it's Duo is, is, is different than MFA, you can actually see in this picture. So I'm, I'm going to watch my network. I use my password and, 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 and my login credentials. And I got my token on the phone saying, Blimp, are you actually going there? So I'm looking at the phone. I'm, no, I'm not working today. I'm, I'm not going there. So I have the cross and the red button also here, which basically means that Duo is by default integrated deeply into your systems and processes. So if, if somebody's doing a multi-factor authentication, and actually he or she is not doing that, we really need to get the feedback. And I can push the red button here, and it confirms, are you sure you're not doing this? I'm sure I'm at the PTO. So we'll get immediately a feedback that my credentials are stolen, and we can act based on those. We talk about this in, in a SecureX, how we can automate things. And that's a very kind of first telltale sign that Duo is so much more than MFA. Duo is also massively easy to, to implement. So it usually starts with the VPN. If, you, if you're using VPN, we used to use a VPN, but there's actually, once again, so much more around the Duo here. So the outcomes of the Duo are actually two very cool things. And it, it's basically because we can integrate it to everywhere, if not using radio, some or, or whatever, build the own software around it. The outcome is that we have two beautiful things ahead. The first is passwordless, and the second world is VPN-less. So I'll show you a picture about that. But Duo in this classical form, it's super easy to integrate wherever you are using there, because Duo is the secondary authentication. So whatever you have in, in a primary, using AD, LDAP, using a VPN, using our our, our VPN concentrator, and you have the users there, whatever, it's your primary. We are the secondary. And with that secondary, there's so much things that comes along. And this was actually the reason why we acquired Duo. So MFA, cool, good stuff. Yes, bad and needed. And of course, the passwordless world is, is outcome of that. But what we really need is the device control. Because if you remember the first pictures, we went to the cloud and we have no idea who's using and doing a what. Somebody is connecting to our cloud, Microsoft 365. If the password and credentials are right, or even the MFA works, 
that's it. We just open up the door to the to our, our, our jewelry, and and that's it. And it could be that the user who's coming to our cloud is actually using a Windows XP or Windows 7 that is hacked in three times already. And, and that's a bad policy. So we need to go further with the MFA. And if we go further, it becomes the zero trust. So it always starts with something easy. We, we don't trust the user. So who's who? So we don't trust, that's an MFA, but we don't for sure trust the endpoints either. So we need to have a visibility who's connected with what. And are, are they, when they're connected, are they actually doing things that they should be doing? And also, what's the posture of that device that they are connecting to the, the services or applications or whatever container we have at the cloud in the new world? So here's a view. So you want to have that complete visibility, just like you would want to have the complete visibility with your with your umbrella line, what's happening at the endpoint, when the endpoint is connecting to the internet, regardless where they are, you want to have the visibility. It same goes also with the zero trust world. You want to have a visibility who's who's doing and what and, and what they're using to do their business. And if you start to see that, hey, there's a 14 percent of, of devices seven in this case that are badly out of date and still connecting to my, my my services that's not a good policy we need to do something and especially if the browser like we do it at the cisco if my browser is late i can't access the network so i need to do something with that so you desperately need the, the visibility and of course if you go further to actually trust the endpoints do i have things in place like is it the managed if it's a phone, if it's an iPhone, it's the managed, it's running the latest software. We've seen this kind of uh, news all over the place now that uh, there's a bad vulnerabilities in, in iPhone. So if, if there's a vulnerability, do I trust that endpoint or, or, or user to actually use that device against my ground jewels or, or confidential data or whatever? Is it encrypted passcode so a firewall enabled if that's the case and biometrics enabled? So, and of course, same for, for the endpoints here. So we need to move pretty fast from the MFA world to the basically the network access control world that we used to probably have in the old world like dot one X and so on. But now, now we use a little bit different tools to do that. But it's basically it's the same outcome. I need to move fast towards the posture, who's using, who's doing, and what. And if you're not even using MFA today, crying out loud, please do that immediately so, so, so we don't trust password. And we talk about a couple of things. And, and that's, that's kind of the slide here. So this is basically a Cisco use case. So, so, so we did this, and there's a video out there. I'll talk about it in a second. But this is probably the best slide ever to explain the fact that if you take the zero trust you take the new concept and, and you adapt those outcomes from SASE also, that how should we actually work in this new world? You'll get the better experience and you get the better security. So first of all, we're going to forget the passwords. We don't need them. You can use a user certificate. It's not mandatory, but you can use. This is the way we do it internally. So we use user certificates. We use the device certificate, once again, not mandatory from the architectural point of view, but massively good to have if you have that. Device health, we just talked about that in a previous slide, that we definitely need that information. Who is who and, and, and what is the device that is connecting? And then we need the MFA component. So once again, device health, not mandatory from the application point of view or, or, or the architectural point of view, but it's good to have. So the bare minimum that you'll need actually is your username, I'll put it here because you're not in a slide, and the MFA, and you can jump to this world. But of course, it's massively beneficial for you, as we've been discussing, to add the device health, go more towards that these are actually our devices and users. But you don't need to do it immediately. You can buy, you can simply buy taking a duo in, use the water integration methods you have available, print the MFA, move along, get rid of the passwords, and you're good to go. And then it's just a question of I'm, am I actually going towards the application that is internal, or am I going towards the cloud? It doesn't really matter. It's the same process. And that's it. The second outcome of the, 
the zero trust is the no no VPN world, so VPN-less world. So zero trust brings you two massively good benefits. First, passwords, passwordless world. You don't need passwords. You can get rid of them, or you can use your weak password from now. You can put the password as a password. It doesn't really matter if you love the passwords, but we let's get rid of them. And then same for the VPN. So get rid of the VPN because VPN also gives you a hassle from the end user point of view. So let's do this the other way. And once again, there's no right or wrong if you still use the VPN. You can use application-based VPN, whatever. But you need to think this through from the end user point of view, where they are, how they are connecting, and, and especially how complicated it will be for them to actually apply the, the security countermeasures. And what we try to do with the, the, the zero trust here for the workforce, meaning people, is that we'll make this as transparent as possible. And at the same time, we are basically increasing the, the security. So we did this as a Cisco. So it was a five month journey. I, I just shared a video about that. So go go and look at the LinkedIn Marco Harrell and you you I, I posted it this week that there's a video about this. How did we actually do this internally in, in five months? So you we have basically hundred thousand users go towards the borderless world. That was the picture that was just the basically here. The so, so this is the borderless world. You don't have borders anymore, but you still need to do security and you're doing that slightly differently. So how do we get rid of the we always on VPN or, or VPN usage and so on? I urge you to look at the 30 minute video from the from the YouTube. It explains everything. And if we did it in the, in the five months as a Cisco, with 100,000 users. If you have like 500 users, 1,000 users, 15,000 users, it's about a couple of weeks for you. You can do this journey. I'll explain a couple of things around that, but it's not hard. Definitely, it is not hard. Cool. So we covered two elements already. The third one is the secure cloud analytics. And this is kind of funny discussion also that uh, we started to use and deploy and, and, and kind of take these cloud services and, and bake them in our on our own so so we have avs and we have containers and and we have everything in the clouds and, and by doing that we didn't have any visibility but on the other hand we had massive networks at the cloud we had containers running there whatever stack we had there we have software as a service combined and, and, and everything you can name it's at the cloud they are connected together, but we don't see anything. It doesn't really make any sense. In the best case, on premise networks, we had a visibility. The, the worst visibility usually is that you look at the firewall logs. The best visibility is that you harness the network metadata to serve you and do things. And this is exactly the same thing that we are doing with the, with the cloud networks here. So we are harnessing the metadata from these services that you know who's doing and what you see every single conversation you understand is this a normal or not and if it's not normal you at least get an alert in the best case you start to automatically do things and mitigate the threats so that's what we are talking about you need to have visibility towards your cloud networks also that is an absolute must because otherwise you end up in a trouble. You end up in a trouble because you don't have any contextual visibility and, and understanding what is happening in your, your data center that is now at the cloud. We'll get this in every POC that we do that people didn't know that I haven't allowed anything to be connected to my cloud data center, but there's a tons of traffic out there. There's a tons of traffic because they are not in a UI you can't control them, but they are happening at the back end. In many cases, you really want to apply some sort of analytics on top of them. But if this is a traffic going towards my container that is not on the UI, I can't block that. <laughs> what is going on there? And, 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 and is it good or bad? And of course, if something is bad, you really need that. But I'll talk about the last kind of point here in a, in a security X, the, the security orchestration automation section in a second. 
the classical things around the visibility are, are of course, kind of threat related. So is, is somebody doing excessive attempts to logging or are we under the DDoS? Is somebody stealing data out here, potential data exfiltration? This is bad stuff. It, it comes with the containers. So, so and, and container ACLs, uh, I'll show that in the next slide. Who's using, once again, the data and where they are connecting? If our business is here, so in, let, let's say at the Nor Nordics and, and so on, while people are from South Africa hanging around with our containers and then doing weird stuff and, and so on. So how, how's, how, how's the life at our, our cloud data center? That's what we are talking about here. And if we have a segmentation in place, is it actually working? But this is kind of the, the classical thing from the visibility. If you, you, you start to do the network de detection and response technology here. So that's the network detection and response use case here. But there's, I would even personally say that there's more powerful thing that comes with these type of technologies. And it's here. I apologize. This is a bad slide because it's basically, it is a screenshot from the, the actual system. So imagine this. You'll have your cloud data center running AVS, running containers, running mix, Google, whatever you, you, you bought, whatever you bought, you, you have that in place. And then you apply this network visibility and control on top of those clouds. And you bring that metadata under analytics and you start to see things that you haven't seen it before. And you can ask questions like, do we actually have public facing instances that are allowed to access non-public S3 buckets? Very, very interesting question. And you can start to ask these questions from your clouds. And remember, the cloud actually can be a combination of AVS, Google, Microsoft. And it actually can be a combination of all of those three plus your own DC. So now I can actually ask questions from my networks. And the second thing is, hmm, are there any EC2 instances exposed to the internet? Hmm. And then you start to get this, that, hey, hmm, we actually made an error while we configured the APIs or when we configured the buckets or, or whatever we did there. And we'll see these things in every POC that we do, proof of concept with the, the technology. Customer is, is taking that in, put the API keys in place, get the visibility, and then they actually start to see what is happening inside of their cloud networks. And 100% of the cases that we've done in Finland, customer has been surprised at what's going on here. We didn't even know that we have these type of things here. And, and and we didn't even know that this bucket here is connected and, and it's 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 basically allow full content access and, and so on. Because guess what? Some of these ACLs that we are talking about here that are part of your buckets and uh, containers and uh, cloud stack are not visible in your UI. That is a very interesting topic also. But anyway, sorry about bad slide because this is screenshots for my system and, and it, it but, but it illustrates the fact that now you can ask really, really interesting questions from your cloud networks. So you have to extend the visibility. That is the key thing. And the best part of this is that when you start to bring the visibility and threat detection to your cloud networks, it is a set of software as a service. You can basically leverage the, the API key thing, put the APIs in place, you're good to go. You, you, you're running in the minutes and get to the world where if, if you have problems in your network and, and you have exposed your network, whatever security risk you have, you, you need, need just simply know that. So if you don't know that you have a problem, you can't really fix the problem. So it is pointless to try to apply a preventive technology to the cloud network if you don't know what you'll have there and you don't know what you try to protect. That's the way it goes. So, so yeah. Of course, you can integrate these type of technologies, the cloud network detection and response, to wherever place. And and of course, the most kind of compelling probably is the sim that you basically take this and put it in your sock. That's the old world. We talk about the secure X in the, in the, in the very very forthcoming slides. One interesting thing that we had with one customer was that they're using WebEx Teams and. Uh, 
do I actually need a SOC platform? Do I actually need a, a, a Splunk if if my network is exactly like like it was here? That I can ask questions, I can automate these questions, and how about automate it in a way that the answers are actually put it in the in the WebEx teams in the format of conversation. <laughs> That's a very interesting topic here. So I can have a conversation with my my network, and I can have conversation with my security. But yeah, there's there's so much more on that. But that was the control number three. You need to bring visibility and control towards the cloud, and we can do that simply by using the network metadata. But we usually don't even know that that's there, and for sure. Most of us are not doing that. We are just simply relying on password and probably strong authentication towards the resources that we have at the cloud. Or we connect it to the cloud directly to our own network, like it's hanging down and it's, it's there protected by the firewall, but it's still the same outcome. We need to get the visibility in place. Cool. So the fourth thing that was combining everything together was the SecureX, and, and oh boy, there's acronyms around there. So sorry about that. So there's a there's a kind of a magic quadrant like security orchestration, automation, and response. So is SecureX a, a SOAR platform? Yes, it is. But then there's another kind of context and 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 quadrant like extended detection and response. Is SecureX XDR? Yes, it is. So it's actually both. The, the way I'm usually describing SecureX, it is an unmanned SOC. It's a cloud service that comes with every single security technology that you'll buy from Cisco and you can use it for free. If you buy Umbrella, like we just discussed, if you buy Duo, or if you buy StealthWatch or, or Network Analytics, you'll get the SecureX capabilities. You have just bought yourself an unmanned SOC. That's the way it goes, because we believe that even if those technologies are best of breed and, and they are super capable in their own kind of contextual world, that is not enough. We need to build a world where everything is connected together and it has to be an open platform. And that's what the, the security X is. So you'll have your cloud world here. You have those controls in place, the NDR, SASE and Zero Trust, what we just went through. That's the cloud world. And then you have a classical, you have firewalls and uh, IPSCs, you have this and that, uh, network detection response capabilities, segmentation, firewalls, well, you name it, you have it there. You need to have something between them that you can actually get a single point of view, what is going on here. You have to have a place to aggregate data, like, like Let's say you, you want to have a third party view of what's going on here, like like those security feeds or, or security intel feed, like like virus total or showdown have been pawned or, and, and so on. So you need to plug and play those to the platform also. And then you need to run applications on top of that. So what are the applications? Threat hunting, for example. You don't trust that the, your environment, whenever it is like looking cool, there's nothing wrong. Don't trust it. It's like with the children. If children are quiet, there's something wrong. And it's same with the cybersecurity. So if everything looks good here, don't settle for that. So do automate the 24 by 7 threat hunting and so on. So there's a couple of things here. SecureX, it is a SOAR and XDR technology combining these two worlds together. It's an open. If it has an API, it's perfectly good for us. Whatever your homegrown application, if it has an API, you can bring it in and, and use it in, uh, in the way you want here. But it's massively compelling if you have those technologies like Umbrella and, and, and Cisco stuff, it's plug and play. Just put them in here and you're running in the minutes. The most kind of compelling thing that comes with um, this kind of technology is, is actually in this slide. So, so let, let's look at the old school world that you had the technology that had a flag. I have an IOC indicator for compromise, or I have an alert here. Boom, there's something going on. It could be a weak signal, it could be a strong signal, it could be whatever. You have something going on there. Then you, and by the way, you can actually have a SIM here. It doesn't, CM, let's, uh, good enough, close enough, CM. You can have the CM here. So all it goes to the CM. Then you start to investigate. Hey, where's the thing that is going on? Where does it actually happen? 
you go through multiple consoles because those multiple consoles are not integrated to your sim you'll have an event it's an event based system it's old school from the year 2000 or so so you need to go through the dashboards and look at how does this actually affect me and then when you eventually find the way that it is affecting you this event here how does it affect me when you find it kind of the, the 360 view you need to go and block that you need to mitigate so you go once again through this portal in the best case you probably have done some sort of integrations here but for sure it's not complete but with the SecureX, the new world as you remember go backwards it's plug and play if it has an api let's rock and roll so you connect your underlying technologies you're just like in the in the SD1 world, you have the underlying technology transport, you have a MPLS, you have a 4G, 3G, 5G, ADSL, that's your underlying technology. It's exactly the same thing here, that you basically connect your underlying technologies here, and you do the overlay, the applications. So in this case, once again, there's something going on. It could be umbrella flagging that somebody from your internal network is actually trying to go in a phishing site, that's blocked. Cool, it's blocked, event here blocked, but hey, do we actually need something else? And yes, we do. So this was actually caused by this IP address, this endpoint, of course, this user, we see the user also, but the whole chain of events started, that you can see that there's a correlation. Something came in as an email and it has this and that senders and so on. And by the way, there was also a file attached. So the whole thing here, the event here, same thing, was actually caused by something slipping through our email defense and it got executed in this system. And after that, the machine is reaching out a bad site. You get that 360 view in a second. How does this event here relate to everything that I have? And now comes the interesting thing. If this is the new starting point, the default, you connect it, your underlay to the SecureX, you're now operating the overlay. You're running and orchestrating your security, open one. Remember, if it's an API, it works. So do I actually want to, as a human being, go out there and click that, hey, let's kind of uh, do something. Let's, let's educate the user. Let's just remove that file. No, I don't want to do that. So what I want to go in a world of orchestration. So this is the unmanned world we are talking about. So we can have that even from the previous slide here. I start to do things. So we try to do this as easier as possible for you. So you can program these platforms to or complex things in the, in the easiest way as possible. You don't need to understand programming language. You don't need to understand anything. It's basically like Lego blocks that you put together. If there's an event, I'm waiting for that event and, and, and I'm doing something and I get the response. I can have humans in the mix. The human can be that, hey, the classical case that we had that somebody's reaching out the phishing site, it's blocked. Boom, that's the event. The next thing is that we probably put the uh, post to the internal block that, hey, we are once again under an attack. Be careful out there. Don't click everything that looks juicy and, 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 and funky. Don't click them. We end up in a trouble. So that could be like the, the step number one. Then we start to do a couple of things more. If, remember, we had the visibility. We know the user. We know everything here. We know all the metadata, everything around it. So if, if that guy whoever clicked that link or if that machine was executing something that was malicious it once again slipped through our defenses it slipped through our educational programs it slipped through everything so i don't trust it at all i don't trust the, the user or the machine at all and i can kick off a forensic work i'll take a forensic snapshot tear down the machine automatically look everything that is running where it's connected how does the history look like and do complete forensic work once again have the end user in the mix hey it's your unmanned sock here, SecureX, hi, take more coffee, read evening papers, go whatever portal, but you can't access the network that we have because we need to do a couple of things for your system. 
and we we continue to inform you how this goes so you can get the end user in the mix this can be if nothing else sms but please do use something more clever if nothing else take a slack take our teams microsoft teams whatever if it has an api and you use that for communicating your end users use that and so that's the thing goes so this is what we are talking about we are replacing the SOC analyst with the workflow and that is a golden stuff and of course if you once again you get all these capabilities by buying a one security program from us you, you buy umbrella you get this capability if you haven't done anything like this ever we don't left you out of cold here you have basically two options go to youtube <laughs> the new training center of the world youtube has everything how do you program this and if you want to run faster we have a service component that we basically build these integrations and workflows for you so we have a service component that obviously has a price tag associated so two options look at the youtube do it by yourself if you end up in trouble ask partners ask at the ask ask us and, and and we can help you but this is the new world so go a little bit backwards so you will had your situational awareness plug and play not just your own environment, threat in the feed, showdown, have I been abused, blah, blah, blah. You have your applications, you're running, you're running threat hunting day in, day out. And, and then the third, the, the final component, you're basically automating and replacing your, your SOC analyst and, and, and creating unmanned SOC. So everybody nowadays can have a SOC and it comes as a freebie if you buy an umbrella or, or or whatever another thing here the last portion of the, the secure x that of course you can take the secure x as is and integrate that to something so let's go a little bit backwards here and uh, let me erase pen boom so if you do it everything like we've been discussing here you can take the secure x as a one API, because everything in a SecureX is an API. Your integrations are in API, the UI, the, the workflow that we discussed, everything here is an API. When you are running and looking at the, the SecureX, it's an API that you are looking at. So you can take everything here, and if you have done commitments like I bought the Microsoft E3 or E5, and I have the Microsoft Sentinel. Hmm. How about if I actually use the SOAR and XDR capabilities here, do exactly what we've discussing to unmanned SOC and take the outcome of the analytics and put that to the Sentinel? Now, wait a minute. That's a very interesting thought. So do I put the raw data from the underlying technologies to the Sentinel? I end up in a trouble with the, <laughs> with, with the payment because it's going to cost you like 15 to 20K a month for, for the disk space storage that you, you'll get from the Sentinel. Or do I just put the one line there that, hey, this the, basically this picture, do I put this in there and then build a link towards the technologies? That's one, once again, one of these things that comes with the new kind of technology and approach that, that if you do it by the book, you use unmanned SOC and use these new capabilities, it's cheaper for you to, to integrate it further and you get the better outcome. So you don't have to justify this, that this is so much better than Sentinel, or this is so much better than this and that. You can use them both because as I said, this is a free and, and you integrate it to the Sentinel and you rock and roll and you have a tangible cost savings in your hands. So we're almost there, five minutes left. So we covered a lot. We covered the, how to get the visibility in the cloud. We covered the, the SASE architecture, network as a service and network security as a service. It is not the firewall at the cloud. We covered the SecureX, how to create unmanned SOC, and then how to put, the, put your journey with the zero trust in place. You don't trust users, device, data, and you don't trust anything. You'll get basically two very, very beautiful outcomes. You get a passwordless and a VPN-less world. And now some of you will think this is way too much. It's going to cost a fortune. I need to cut my wrists here. This is way, way, way too much. But I can assure you, it is not. Here is a classical proof of value, proof of concept, invitation, uh, an agenda for our customers when we do this day in, day out. So we start at the nine o'clock. 
look at the look at the umbrella and look at the sassy a little bit deeper than we did today we had one hour for four of these things now we can use the full hour in this for for, for get the foundation with the sassy in place and put that in a production in a zero impact we get the visibility we, we take care of the control as we have more so that is a one hour thing then another hour, we got, of course, more coffee here, more coffee. You need more coffee, definitely. So we can select, do we go for the dual and zero trust path, or do we take the, the cloud analytics? Either way, it is a one hour slot. So two hours, we basically put two things in a production. We put the SASE in a production, we put the network analytics or zero trust in a production. And we have our journey towards either the passwordless world or we have the visibility and control deployed to the production our buckets and so on. And the third hour, just before the lunch, because we are done for the noon, for the lunch, we'll put the SecureX integration in place. We create unmanned SOC for you. We put the integration for threat feeds intelligence. We get you the situational awareness. It's out of the box automations that you have out there and we can build our very own. And that will take about an hour. So this is what we do day in day out with our, with our customers and partners. So. Take the morning slot, starting from nine. What is this? What is that? And and so on. Regardless what you pick here, what combination before the lunch, you'll have unmanned SOC running. And remember, the unmanned component here is, is free for you. Just buy an umbrella or skip skip one of these. It doesn't matter. Skip skip one. So it's two hour, three hour in, instead of three hour workshop. So it is not this it is not too much for you it is not cutting your wrists it is actually fairly simple and straightforward because as said before the, the threat landscape has evolved a lot but at the same time the technologies and architectures have evolved we just kind of missed that we thought that we had that already in place when we went to the cloud yes we had a password we didn't have anything like this in place so so it's a summary, very much, very, very last slide here. The cloud do not and does not remove remove the need for your controls. You have to have the visibility. You have to have exactly the same things that we've been doing in our own network. In the most cases, the the, the controls, if you look at them, the outcome of those architectures, they are exactly the same that we had before. But now we have different technologies. We have SASE, we have Zero Trust, we have XDR, SOAR, and we have the net network detection and response towards the cloud. And the best of all, we are in a world that this is actually, as you remember, the agenda that we do with our, our customers and partners day and day. It's super clean and fast approach. And you can get the outcome in, 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 in less than three hours. And it's a, also, it's a better end user experience and a massive elevation of the security. That's it. So we covered a lot. <laughs> so definitely, if you want to hear more, I'm, I'm available. We can set up a session, but we covered those four things that are, are the elements. We covered a lot. So it was a bit of a run, but I uh, hope you enjoyed that. But from my side, we are spot on time. Thank you very much for this session.